This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by the Electric Vehicle Fall Festival, the biggest and most fun EV event in the Mid-Atlantic region. Taking place at Dominion Raceway in scenic Spotsylvania County, Virginia, the EV Fall Fest will feature a ride and drive, EV education zone, judged EV car show with cash prize, and track time for EV owners on the two-mile DR road course and eighth-mile drag strip. Tickets are on sale now via Eventbrite, and you can also check out the Facebook event page, both Both links will be in the show notes. Coming up this week, the next generation of Dodge muscle cars will be all electric. LG battery cells are still catching fire. Herbert Deese is leaving Volkswagen Group and more. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 116 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. It has been an awesome week, both in the world of EV news as well as in my personal EV life, and I'll get to that bit later. But it has been exciting, and I'm feeling really good. Actually, I just came home from a local Cars and Coffee meet, so honestly, I'm still Uh, on a high, if you will, from talking with all of the car enthusiasts and making some new friends in the EV world as well. However, before we get to all the news this week, I want to thank our podcast partner, Titan Auto & Tire, for their support. Titan just held the ribbon cutting on their latest location, bringing the total to three independent shops here in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, head to TitanAutoTire.com. That's TitanAutoTire.com. All right, first up in the news is a story from the Wall Street Journal about our favorite Vietnamese EV manufacturer, VinFast. Actually, I think they are the only (laughs) Vietnamese EV manufacturer, but hey, we'll ignore that. They are certainly the favorites, and they are moving very aggressively, opening their first U.S. showrooms in July in California and are moving to expand operations all across the U.S., including a plan to spend $2 billion to bring a new EV factory to North Carolina. VinFast is starting with six outlets in California and plans to open another two dozen locations in the state this year before expanding to other U.S. markets. The locations don't sell vehicles, but in a similar model to Tesla, Polestar, Lucid, you know, they are more galleries where shoppers can browse options and then work with staff to place reservations online. The EV company, established in 2017 in Vietnam, plans to sell two all-electric sport utility vehicles here in the U.S. to start. A midsize SUV called the VF8, that one's going to start at a little bit more than $40,000, and then a larger VF9 will start at $55,500. U.S. buyers can place orders now with deliveries expected to start at the end of 2022, So they say, uh, I am a bit skeptical of that timeline, but hey, you know, I would absolutely love for them to prove me wrong. Something really unique about their business model is that when buyers purchase the vehicle from VinFast, either the VF8 or the VF9, they aren't actually buying the whole car. Buyers will pay one price for the vehicle, but then lease the battery for a monthly fee. And that's similar to the way Renault had a program in Europe, for those familiar with it. VinFast is going to offer two different battery subscription plans, costing anywhere from $35 a month to $160 a month, depending on how much the owner wants to drive, the model they purchased, and the type of battery. The fee includes maintenance of the battery and replacement when charging capacity drops below 70% of its original capacity. VinFast has said that the battery leasing model brings the upfront price of its vehicles down by fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, roughly on par with what many gasoline-powered vehicles sell for today. And the company also said that it eliminates risks for the customer because the service covers all repairs, all maintenance, replacement costs, including swapping out the battery for a newer one. So I think personally that is great, and as much as I love owning everything about my car, a battery lease makes a lot of sense because that is the biggest thing that is a worry 
for for EV owners. How long is the battery going to last? Do I have to deal with degradation? Uh, if you go to replace it, you know, how many thousands and thousands of dollars do you need to spend in order to get a new battery? Battery lease eliminates all those problems. There's zero risk for the consumer. I really, I wish them all the success in the market, and I hope that they do well. Next, Hertz gave several updates on its fleet of Tesla and Polestar all-electric vehicles, which it started offering to customers earlier this year. During its earning call for Q2 2022 held, uh, I believe it was a week ago Thursday. So this is slightly outdated information, but if you haven't heard it, you definitely uh, want to. Hertz expanded its EV offerings to 16 new cities earlier this month and has, I guess that would be July, uh, (laughs) and has experienced widespread success all across its EV fleet. Initially, they had ordered 100,000 Tesla Model 3 and Model Y vehicles in October of last year, and that move was basically their introduction into EV adoption, which has then expanded to other automakers, including Polestar, who announced a 65,000-unit deal with the rental agency just a few months later. The 100,000-vehicle deal with Tesla was not offered at discount, however, Hertz has maintained that its adoption of Teslas has resulted in a dramatic spike of interest from renters. Company CEO Stephen Scher said, quote, With respect to EVs specifically, over 15,000 Uber drivers to date have rented a Tesla from Hertz at a minimum rate of $334 per week, comprising over half a million transaction days, Driver feedback has been positive, and they remain drawn to the opportunity as gasoline prices remain elevated and demand for the service among Uber customers is strong. Our Tesla's enabled Uber drivers could differentiate themselves and to improve upon the quality of their riders' experience, and that translates into higher earnings for them, end quote. Interesting to note, I did look into the rental for Uber with, uh, or the Tesla rental through Uber through Hertz. Boy, that's easy for me to say. Uh, $334 a week, you know, that is quite pricey. But it also can, I mean, they are renting it. So they don't have to worry about repairs. I believe uh, insurance is covered in that as well. So you're looking at your total cost and that's really, it sounds like a lot. I mean, $1,200 a month, but it's really not that bad considering that, the people that are doing that are driving all the time, it still ends up saving them maybe even $1,000 a month uh, that they're not spending on fuel and maintenance costs for their own car. Hertz detailed on the call that it has accepted around 20,000 electric vehicles in its fleet since taking deliveries of its various EVs, and Cher continued that deliveries are ongoing, of course. Electric vehicles are most often noted for their drastic reductions in service— compared to combustion engine vehicles, which results in a lot more savings over the lifespan of the car due to fewer moving parts, and Hertz is learning that lesson pretty easily. According to Cher, who's stated that the company is seeing a roughly 50 to 60% decrease in maintenance costs, he said, quote, On maintenance, I think Kenny said to you, we are running kind of 50 to 60% of what maintenance costs are on ICE vehicles. That's roughly in line with where we are. If there's anyone surprised, it's probably a slightly higher expense on tires, but not much more, and that's embedded in the figure I'm giving you. So I would say overall, we are very pleased with the results. They're coming in roughly in line with what we thought when we first underwrote the move in this strategic direction, end quote. Additionally, Kenny Chung, of course, the Kenny that was referenced in that previous quote, is Hertz CFO, also commented on the maintenance cost reductions, saying, quote, As for the primary drivers of the year-on-year increase, we experienced higher cost and transportation and fuel, reflecting the effect of broader inflationary trends as well as in maintenance on order fleet. We expect maintenance expenses to moderate as our fleet continues to grow younger, On the forward, we anticipate additional operating leverage as more expensive third-party labor strategically replaced with Hertz employees, and we further reduced maintenance expense as we rejuvenate the fleet and continue to grow our number of EVs, end quote. Cher said that customers seem to be more interested in renting Teslas over and over again, which has translated to an increase in repeat clients for the company. 
He said, quote, I think we have schooled our customers on how to use them so much so I think there's an embedded tether there, he said. They're coming back to use the car and rent the car more frequently, and I think all of those are expressions of the first mover edge that we have around EVs, end quote. Consumers may be hesitant to try a new technologically advanced product, especially when dealing with a car. However, it seems that once Hertz's rental clients make the jump to an EV, they're much more likely to come back simply because of the ease of access and features. And none of this information is coming of a surprise to those of us who are EV owners, of course, but it is real nice to see that real world validation of what we know. EVs are better and people really, really like them. Next, a sound that you won't hear much on this podcast is coming to an end. That would be the sound of a supercharged V8 Dodge Challenger Hellcat, a vehicle that defines internal combustion engine performance and a motor that when put into the Charger, Durango, or even I think the Jeep Trackhawk, utterly destroys most anything that tries to mess with it. It is the epitome of the modern American muscle car, and it's near its end. Contrary to recent reports suggesting that the V8 will continue alongside electric offerings of the Dodge vehicles, Dodge's next-generation muscle car lineup will be electric only with no V8 option available. None. Dodge's spokesperson, Dave Elshoff, didn't mince words when speaking with Motor Authority recently, saying, quote, The original story was false. As Tim, the company's CEO, confirmed to you, the Charger Challenger platform and its Hemi V8 power go away after 2023. The unnamed replacement will be a battery electric vehicle, end quote. And to Tim Kuniskis, the CEO, he told Motor Authority at the 2021 LA Auto Show that the Hellcats and their current platforms will continue through the end of 2023, so that leaves less than two years to buy the current vehicles. At the time, he noted that it wasn't just the Hellcat itself, but the platform and the powertrain as we know it. So if you're in the market for some V8 sound with your muscle car, get them now. You've got a limited time before the whine of a supercharger gets replaced with the whine of an electric motor. And honestly, I'm kind of surprised by this move. Granted, I think it is the natural move, but I didn't think that Stellantis, who are the parent company of Dodge, would move this quickly to replace their icons. I definitely expect a lot of pushback from their traditional buyers, but maybe... Just maybe they will find some new buyers that appreciate the all-electric muscle. All right, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about the potential EV tax credit coming back for companies like GM and Tesla and the soon-to-be Ford and Toyota as they hit the $200,000 limit or 200,000 unit limit. And it was arguably the biggest news story uh, in the EV world this week. So let's get right to talking about the Uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the potential EV tax credit uh, proposals that are included within. And this is yet another example of politicians acting on behalf of their lobbyists and not thinking about the actual real world effect of their policy. The Inflation Reduction Act would nearly eliminate the actual EVs that are eligible for a tax credit instead of promoting EVs and making it easier for buyers to get behind the wheel. And I know if you've only looked at the headlines, what I just said might seem absolutely crazy. So let's take a look at what has actually been proposed here. Under the bill, the credits would not be tied to any automaker, but would continue for all qualifying EVs until the end of 2032. So 10 years from now, no 200,000 unit cap. The money is there for anybody and everybody. That is great news. Obviously, it definitely helps Toyota, Tesla, and General Motors, uh, but then also Ford and Nissan, who were close to that cap. They are the automakers that have either already run out or the ones that are very close to it. So it kind of would put them on an even playing field with the other manufacturers that aren't even close or haven't made any EVs and now they're starting to ramp up. Car buyers would also be able to get that credit as a discount at the time of sale, like a 
on the hood or as a down payment or as a price reduction. So instead of being something that they need to wait to file their taxes, when they're buying a new car, the dealer can essentially apply for the tax credit and then apply give that to the owner, and then the dealership would get the money at the end of the tax year. So that's great because now it doesn't matter who you are, you can get the full $7,500. So that's good. The bill also sets an upper income limit on who can get the credit, meaning that we no longer have to hear that the tax credits are only for the rich. Anyone making more than $150,000 a year or a family at $300,000 a year would not be eligible for this credit. There are also limits on how expensive a vehicle can be to qualify, with the upper price limit on vans, trucks, and SUVs now set at 80000 while all other vehicles are limited to a price of 55000 And for the first time, and this is a part that I'm excited about, used EVs would also be eligible for a rebate of either $4,000 or 30% of the vehicle's sale price, whichever one is smaller. Maximum price of a qualifying used EV is $25,000, and it has to be at least two years old. Income limits do exist for that as well, and they're half of the other. So $75,000 for single, $150,000 for joint. Um, So that's great. The bill also changes the definition of what kinds of vehicles can get the credit from qualified plug-in electric drive motor vehicle to clean vehicle which then opens the door for hydrogen and other powertrain types to be considered the same as battery-only EVs from the federal tax credit perspective. Now, that one I'm not as keen on because, of course, if you have a a, a hybrid, does that qualify as a clean vehicle? I don't know. But all of that, you know, with the, the, the way that credit would work, sounds pretty great, doesn't it? An immediate price reduction for every EV on the market. I mean, that sounds great. However, what's not great is that they put in the bill a bunch of qualifiers or honestly, really disqualifiers. You see, the bill requires automakers to use critical minerals for their batteries that were extracted and processed in North America or a country the U.S. has a trade agreement with, uh, the free trade agreement. The bill requires qualifying clean vehicles to use a minimum amount of such materials starting at 40% uh, for vehicles put into service before January of 2024, then going up by 10% a year until it reaches 80% for vehicles placed in service after December 31st, 2026. Similarly, all qualifying clean vehicles need to have their battery components manufactured or assembled in North America at a similar increasing scale, starting at 50% for vehicles put in service before January 1st, 2024, and growing to 100% starting in 2029. So, how many EVs would actually qualify for that? Well, as it turns out, not so many. An analysis by the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, on Wednesday suggested that just 11,000 new EVs would use the credit in 2023, next year. Only 11,000. Thousand, And that number might seem small, but take into account that the Tesla Model 3 long range, the performance, all of the Model Y, the Model S, Model X, none of them would qualify. All of Rivian's vehicles, the Lucid Air, too expensive, they wouldn't qualify. Uh, GM's vehicles, the Hummer EV, the upcoming Chevy uh, Silverado EV that, well, not the base trim, but the more expensive, the Ford F-150 Lightning, the more expensive, like the Lariat or the Premier. I can't remember what it's named, but the higher trims, they're too expensive. They wouldn't qualify. 11,000 vehicles next year, and that's before the ramp up for the mineral um, uh, requirements. (laughs) And like mineral requirements like lithium or manganese, cobalt, all of that, like Where do those come from? (laughs) Because it's not here in the U.S. Uh, According to John Bozella, and he is the head for the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, he says that up to 70% of U.S. electric, plug-in hybrid, and fuel cell EVs would be ineligible for a tax credit, leaving 30% of the market that could. And honestly, that's even more uh, optimistic than the 11,000 that the CBO was estimating for next year. 
Now, I understand why they put all the restrictions on battery mineral sourcing and manufacturing in the bill. I mean, it's it's a direct push against Chinese imports and an attempt to push the mineral sourcing here to the U.S. and North America. But that's something that takes time, a long time. And while I don't mind that later, you know, I mean, even beyond 10 years, what we need right now is a bill that includes as many EVs as possible, regardless of where the battery minerals come from, regardless of how expensive they are. Okay, next, a story about EV battery fires. And yes, I know EVs catch on fire much less than gas-powered cars. But in this case, I actually want to focus on what seems to be a common denominator. You see, in addition to the Chevy Bolts, which went through an entire recall of more than 144,000 vehicles, the and then only 17 Chevy Bolts actually caught on fire. The Hyundai Konas, the Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid, the minivan, and there have now been a few fires, four, of Jaguar I-Pace vehicles. Now, you may think, what is the possible connection between an American car, the Chevy, a Korean car, European EVs? You might think, if you're not familiar with electric vehicles and you're just kind of on the on the outside looking in, that all EVs must be fire prone because of the vast differences in those vehicles. It just it must be a common problem. However, the common variable is that these all use battery cells from LG. So while the risk is quite low that a fire would happen if even if you own one of these vehicles, it's definitely a concern that all of the major major fire issues outside of Tesla, of course, are all happening as a result of faulty LG battery cells. And personally, I wouldn't be too thrilled about having one of these vehicles unless it had the battery pack replaced like the ones with the Chevy Bolt EV and EUV that they're still on undergoing. I mean, not all of them have been replaced yet. So, yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was kind of interesting that yet another vehicle is showing signs of, of having problems. And it seems like the common denominator is LG. And I'm sure LG makes wonderful batteries, and I mean, most of them do not catch on fire, so, you know, (laughs) there's something to be said for that, I guess. But what is going on that is even allowing this to happen? Uh, Lastly, another high-profile news story that you likely know everything about. Uh, Herbert Deese has been offered the exit door from his role as CEO of Volkswagen Group. It was announced last week that Deese would step down from his role to be replaced by current Porsche CEO Oliver Bloom. And at first, it wasn't immediately clear what led to Deese's sudden oust, but a new report from Bloomberg sheds light on a possible reason. Bloomberg suggests that Deese was removed after severe software development delays and setbacks disrupted the scheduled launches of a handful of new Porsches, Bentleys, and Audis. And adding insult to injury, buggy software is what originally delayed the Volkswagen ID range of electric cars. I mean, if you remember the ID3, they had made a lot of them and they were just sitting there waiting for a software update before they could be sold. Dies also was not exactly loved by his Volkswagen peers, mostly because of his rather tough leadership style and his ability to just say it how it is, and I, it didn't seem like that went over well, especially within Volkswagen. As Bloomberg reports, in his push to transform the company into an electric vehicle leader, he repeatedly clashed with labor leaders by warning that VW was losing out to Tesla and needed to cut thousands of jobs in order to uh, make that transition. And nobody really wanted to hear that. They just kind of wanted to stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 we can't hear you. Um, but he he said, look, you know, Tesla is doing this. We need to do that if we're going to be competitive. And so now he's gone. Um, but honestly, there's more to it because back in December, Volkswagen overhauled its management board, stripping Deese of some responsibilities and then basically putting him more in charge of Carriad, the software. And while there's been a lot of rearranging since then, Deese didn't seem to manage to make the issues go away. So these issues with the software even delayed the rollout of the electric uh, the electric Porsche Macan, which is bad news given that Porsche is looking to offer an IPO later this year. 
And Audi's slate of new electric vehicles was also pushed back by two years to 2027. Meanwhile, Bentley's plan to go all electric by the end of the decade is definitely on life support and will be leaning very heavily on the relationship with Rimac. So all around, there have been major, major issues brewing. While all of these factors might have contributed to Deese's downfall at VW Group, there is a slightly more scandalous rumor about the events surrounding his sudden dismissal, and that is that allegedly Deese had an affair with a direct report, somebody that reported directly to him, promoted her, and then got her pregnant. And now, granted, that's only a rumor, but certainly if remotely true, one that would definitely get you kicked out of your position. And honestly, even if it weren't true, just bringing that up is enough to get somebody fired. So it's unlikely that anybody will ever know what was actually said in the meeting that ended Deese's tenure as CEO of Volkswagen Group. But he isn't going away immediately. He is going to stay at the helm until September 1st. Then, of course, his successor, Oliver Bloom, will combine that new role with his current position at Porsche. And Bloom has been very much in favor of e-fuels using existing internal combustion technology. So does this mean that there's going to be a shift away from EVs or a slower transition at Volkswagen? Remains to be seen. I mean, Deese was absolutely pushing hard. He was at the forefront of the EV revolution at Volkswagen. I mean, the spending plan called for investing $91 billion in software and EVs over the next five years. And just one year ago, they committed to hiring 10,000 people just for the software operations alone. So will that change? Uh, And then, of course, everybody's asking, you know, where will Deese go? What will he do? Will he come to Tesla? Because obviously he has a very strong relationship with Elon Musk and nobody knows. So you'll have to stay tuned on that. All right. So that is all the news this week. But let me tell you, I've got some awesome things to share with you coming up right now. It has been a happy week at the Hearst household. Uh, We went from a driveway that had a Polestar 2 and Chevy Impala, both loaner cars, to a fully restored EV driveway. We got the Tesla back, and I made a short YouTube video about that that you can check out. And as you might have guessed, if you've been listening to the podcast for a little while, a huge surprise for me this week when the Chevy dealership called me up and said that the Spark EV was ready to be picked up. That's right, the EV resource Spark EV is fresh off the battery assembly line and back on the road. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration that I'll get to. If you're new to hearing me rant, maybe this is the first podcast episode you've listened to, or maybe the the last couple that I haven't really talked about the Spark. Um, The saga of the Spark EV has been going on for quite a while, actually about four months. On April 7th, the car died. Wouldn't drive, wouldn't charge, dead. And after having it towed to the dealership, I was told by GM Corporate that the car would never drive again, that they didn't have the battery packs, they wouldn't be making the battery packs, and because I was still under warranty, my only option would be for them to buy back the car. Naturally, I was devastated. I love my little polished turd, as I uh, affectionately call it. But after writing an article about the issue with the Spark EVs, because it wasn't only me with the battery problems, uh, GM backtracked and said publicly that they would support the car for the foreseeable future. However, that language was very vague and didn't give any of us Spark EV owners a timeline that we could hold on to and for expecting to have a repair. Some owners told me that they were getting told later this year. So I was expecting that my car would sit there for another four months. I mean, I I really didn't have any timeline. There was no ETA, no expectation of when I would get a new battery pack. And the interesting thing is that I didn't get a new battery pack. GM actually shipped all of the battery cells to the dealership and the EV tech here had to assemble the pack himself. (laughs) I mean, okay, whatever. You know, I I don't know if this is what Spark EV owners will expect. Um, 
it's interesting. So I've got all new cells in my battery pack, and I'm actually showing roughly 16 and a half kilowatt hours of usable battery, which is great. That's three more kilowatt hours than I had at this time last year. So, and I've got the car back. So I, I'm happy. Uh, the problem is, while I know that I am the first that has gotten this uh, resurrection, if you will, I am not so sure that other Spark EV owners will have the same experience. I have, I'm have, i still getting many reports of other owners being only offered buybacks like I was initially, and some in Canada being told outright to stop asking for their cars to get fixed. And it's a real shame because, I mean, I don't know, I love this car. I, th- I know other owners love their cars, and... As thrilled as I am about my personal situation, it doesn't look like the situation with the company and these cars has changed. Um, That being said, I have emailed the head of Chevy Communications, Kevin Kelly, a list of questions asking for details and clarification. And when I get a response, official response from the company, I will report back what I find out. So that is your show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Please share this with your friends and anybody that you know that's interested in electric vehicles. If you want to listen to any of the previous shows, you can find them on the webpage under the podcast section and on most of the major podcast platforms. If you want more EV resource content, I encourage you to check out the YouTube channel as well and sign up for the monthly magazine that uh, uh, unfortunately hasn't been solid every month. Like I skipped July because I just... I didn't have time. I couldn't get to it. August is in the works, so I'm really hoping that in the next couple days I can finish that and get that out because I want you guys to have that. Uh, I'm doing a full Polestar 2 review because, of course, I had that vehicle for a month, did all of the performance tests, everything else. Uh, I am going to write an updated article about the Spark EV thing, so if that's not in the August magazine, that'll be uh, in September. I'm going to write about the legacy of Herbert Deese because, of course, as him leaving, I think there's so much that can be said about uh, uh, the credit that he deserves, both at BMW as well as at at Volkswagen. Um, And then I'm going to write about the uh, EV adoption and sales because really things are just soaring to new heights here in the U.S. as well as globally. And I think that's important to share as well. So if you're interested in those topics, if you will, Uh, keep an eye out for the August magazine, get to the website, sign up so that when I do get that out, you will receive it in your email. I want to thank our Patreon supporters, part of the Patreon family, uh, Rajiv Narayan and Christopher Lawrence. They are leading the pack at the executive producer tier, which is only $10 a month. Charles Hall is supporting at the producer tier, which is $5 a month. If you enjoy the podcast and the magazine and the YouTube and basically everything else that I'm doing here with EV Resource, and you feel like I've earned your support, and I stress that I don't, I'm not asking for a handout. I want uh, you really need to get value from all of this. Uh, head over to Patreon.com/slash EV Resource. The tiers are at five and ten dollars right now, but you can always choose a custom monthly amount. So if you feel like spending, uh, you know, giving five hundred dollars a month, you can or fifty cents. I mean, I, I don't care. I really don't. Um, it does make a big difference combined, but not one single individual is necessarily um, a make or break for the EV resource budget. So. I appreciate it. I definitely uh, I'm humbled by your support because that's it's a lot different than a business, you know, uh, giving money like uh, obviously I talk about Titan Auto Entire a lot. They have been with me since the beginning um, and I absolutely love and adore them. I take my own vehicles to them. But, um, you know, the Patreon is not something that without I'm going to lose anything. So the fact that individuals are giving their hard earned dollars to support my efforts here at EV Resource, it kind of means a, a something more, you know? Uh, so I appreciate that. I'm very humbled by that. I've also teamed up with OMU. They make lithium 12 volt batteries, a lithium ion 12 volt batteries. So not the lead acid batteries we're all used to. So if you're in the market for a new 12 volt battery for primarily Teslas, but other EVs, you can, you can make it work. Uh, Check out the link in the show notes for a 5% discount. I know that's not much, but hey, it's better than nothing. Uh, They do throw me a couple dollars if you use the promo 
promo code EVR at checkout. So if you need a new 12 volt battery anyway, you might as well go check it out. Yes, they are a little bit more expensive than your lead asset batteries, but they will last a lot longer. They will perform a lot better. There really isn't anything better on the market. So check them out. Uh, as always, I invite your feedback via email to hello at ev-resource.com. And, uh, well, I guess that's it. So thank you so much for being with me and I will catch you next week.